Okay, let's have some fun. Uh, kia ora tato, everyone. Kamihi nui ki kato katoa, and uh, welcome to this talk on global nutrition guideline development. So I guess the first question we should ask is, um, why are nutrition guidelines important? Nutrition guidelines are very much an upstream of resource. It's not that we keep a copy of them in the kitchen drawer. Instead, they're picked up and used to shape the food environment and nutrition guidance around us. They can inform curriculum development in our schools or workplace initiatives um, for healthy employees. Um, they can inform advice given at point of care for healthcare professionals, um, as well as uh, public health initiatives, such as reducing the sodium in bread or making healthy choices available in public spaces. They can also be shared across geographical borders um, for say low and middle income countries that don't have the resources to develop their own. Importantly, uh, nutrition guidelines are not the only thing uh, shaping the food environment and nutrition guidance. In fact, nutrition guidelines often run counter to the larger influences that have a commercial interest. So for the food environment, product development by food industry is almost always done for increasing um, profit or income or market share. Um, and these products have to be appealing, not, not necessarily healthy. Nutrition guidance can also be influenced by commercial interests. So um, influencers with large uh, media profiles where they get ads or people with lifestyle advice or ranges of products or cooking books. Um, and, and also unfortunately scientists who have obtained some relevance or traction by being counterculture or subversive. These are undeniably strong influences on what people eat, um, and they are largely unregulated with few exceptions. So it's important that nutrition guidelines do exist and they are visible. So these upstream nutrition guidelines are meant to be evidence-based and health promoting. It doesn't make them particularly sexy uh, and they don't usually change that much over time, which is a common perception with them. It would be quite interesting if they did um, and they would get more intention, but uh, in truth, the evidence-based guidelines tend to stay consistent and they just get more nuanced. Uh, a lot of guideline developers do so for altruism, for human good, um, and agencies like governments who release guidelines um, do what they can that, so that we remain healthy, um, working, tax-paying uh, members of society. So one slide on how guidelines are developed. It's not everyone's cup of tea, so I'll do this quickly. Uh, guidelines are developed by a group with a diverse range of perspectives and ideally or essentially no conflict of interest. They're developed with a detailed predetermined plan of attack, something that is transparent and reproducible. They're developed by searching for all the available evidence on a topic, um, uh, following a best process guideline that should uh, reduce bias. They're developed by synthesizing the available evidence and then looking at the robustness of that data to make sure it's quite consistent and that there's no gaps. Um, they're developed by considering the broader context of releasing a guideline. So these are considerations like acceptability, feasibility, the potential to introduce inequities um, and cultural appropriateness of the messaging. And then ideally guidelines are developed with a period of public or member review. Uh, and this is really for accountability or defensibility, as well as the, the guideline development group here being uh, open to new data or new ideas from other people who also know a lot on the subject. So EDOR's role in guideline development. Really luckily for this talk, uh, EDOR's had a lot of guidelines come out in the last year, ones that we've supported or informed or worked with. Um, these in particular are the WHO Global Guidelines for the general population, and there's been four in the last year. Um, there are topics that are up there, but previous ones have also um, included things like sugars intakes and others advice that's in particularly relevant, as well as the WHO Global stuff. Um, this came out in June uh, this year. This is the European Guidelines for the Clinical Management of Diabetes Through Dietary Choices and Nutrients. Um, so another one, but more targeted towards people with existing uh, diabetes. And so what do all these guidelines say? What are the consistent messages across them all? So we can look at this and we will look at this in a couple of different ways, uh, starting with nutrients. And I'm particularly focused on macronutrients because other than sodium, which is a macronutrient, they, the macronutrients cover the burden, uh, the majority of the burden of attributable to diet for disease. So for carbohydrates, most of the messaging now relates to quality and not quantity. We say a wide range of carbohydrates is acceptable provided you meet your quality metrics. A common quality metric is, is fiber. And so for the general public uh, from the World Health Organization, have at least 25 grams of fiber per day. 
And then for the diabetes, diabetologia one, uh, it's for people with diabetes have at least 35 grams of fiber per day. For interest, New Zealanders hover around 20 grams of fiber per day. So there's still some gains there that we could make and see appreciable health benefits for the population. The fats uh, story is also more about quality, not quantity. It's replacing saturated and trans fatty acids uh, and increasing intakes of, of mono and polyunsaturated fats. And then the protein recommendations have been pretty stagnant for quite a few decades. It's just 10 to 20% of total energy. However, I will say now that people are looking at um, plant sourced or plant derived protein versus meat derived protein. Uh, and some of the evidence is indicating potential health differences there, those two sources. So it'll be really interested to see in the next couple of years if that'll be um, taken up, considered and incorporated into guidelines, because then we might have this consistent sort of picture if it's about quality and macronutrients and not quantity, uh, allowing for wider ranges so long as they're from appropriate sources. So watch that space. That's the nutrient level. If we look at the food level, I have quite a um, complex sentence there. But typically for guideline developers, we don't just look at micronutrients or macronutrients and then infer on foods. We look at both. And ideally, we see a consistent signal where the um, carbohydrate containing food has a similar pack package or, or, or presence as the carbohydrate itself. Here for guidelines, um, largely the, the focus for foods is a, a pro, uh, focus on minimally processed plant foods, such as whole grains, vegetables, whole fruit, legumes, nuts and seeds, and then a reduction in things that are a little bit more processed, uh, such as red and processed meats or uh, sugar sweetened beverages. If you take that big long sentence and you look at, well, what are the carbohydrate containing foods? Those are the two sort of elements there that focus on carbohydrate quality. And then if you incorporate the fats, these are the two sentences there that promote or reduce certain fats. So those messages from the macronutrients are incredibly um, visible at the food level. Just that difference, that, that new aspect of sodium here as well too, because we know sodium is, is very much associated with stroke. So that's the food level. If we jump to the patterns level, most of the evidence for patterns relates to Mediterranean or vegetarian dietary patterns. And I've popped the Nordic on there too, because we did that for the European guidelines. It's relevant to them. If you look though about the consistency and in the foods that are recommended, you'll see these food groups always being the same. Everyone is recommending whole grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, and nuts. Um, now they differ between those regions. And a good example here is actually the oils in the Mediterranean, it's extra virgin olive oil is recommended. Whereas the Nordic, um, the cooler climate growing canola oil is actually the recommended oil. Similar-ish fat profile. The key thought is that while we're talking about patterns, we're still talking about the similar food groups. We're just enabling a level of translation that promotes individualization of guidelines. Guidelines are always going to be generic and say you should have more vegetables because we're not alienating people um, who like specific vegetables or, or are used to specific vegetables and not other ones. So uh, patterns are useful for that reason, but you see there are huge consistency in what is recommended. And then final point here is that diet is important, but it's not everything. So diet sits within the context of the lifestyle um, and other things such as uh, good hygiene practices, medication adherence, uh, environmental sustainability, regular physical activity, social time and whānau are all very important things too in our health. So if I could summarize real quick, evidence-based nutrition guidelines are an important resource for many stakeholders although they are upstream approaches and they have moderately low visibility for individuals. Their purpose really is to promote health and not generate income for a small number of people, such as those commercial interests. There is a prescribed way of doing them and many tools in place to boost reproducibility and reduce bias in that approach. They often recognize a range of different approaches such as nutrient guidelines, but they're coached in foods that contain the nutrients and they typically sit within patterns that which people recognize or familiar with and then within the broader um, lifestyle context. And then their, their guidance recognizes social, cultural and personal preferences by providing a range of possible healthy eating behaviors. So again, this is this, this criticism of being generic and only saying eat more vegetables. Um, but the need for that is because you're not alienated members of the population who might not be used to, say, avocados. If you just recommended avocados above other vegetables, it's really that generalizedly that is necessary for effective messaging and not alienating people. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, Dee.